surprised me by saying that you started off life as a trainee priest. Um, you've, you've taken a rather meandering course since then. Where have you been and where, where are you now? Oh, well, thanks, Richard. I, I never quite started the training. I got through the selection process. Um, uh, the context of this was that Trish had me in front of a rather nice stained glass window in a, a converted building in the, the Oxford campus. It was a church, yes. yes. But I, I guess the key point is um, I have a very strong sense of vocation. Uh, and by that, I don't mean a vocation to a particular thing. It's just an attitude. It's about when the call comes, you should try to say yes and do interesting um, things. So most of my career has been entirely accidents of history. Um, I took a two-year temporary law lectureship, which lasted 29 years. Um, <laughs> in the middle of that, uh, someone created NHS trusts, and I was invited to become a non-executive director. And then by accident, I acted up as chair. Um, one of the few things that I set out to try and do was the Health Research Authority job. I think I got this invitation because I currently chair the Health Research Authority. And that was sort of a combination of accident and design. Um, when they dismantled the NHS structures I was involved with, I was at that stage chair of a primary care trust and the commissioner. And we had the bonfire of the Quangos and they abolished the Human Genetics Commission, which I was then chairing. I wondered where I might be able to do some good and it struck me that the Health Research Authority would enable me to bring together public service experience I'd got, chairing boards, and uh, my academic life interested in, in law and ethics relating to, to healthcare. Um, and it sort of sense gave me an opportunity to challenge one of the uh, disgruntled users, shall I say, or citizens from my, my past, who on two occasions presented me with a roll of red duct tape because I was so bound up in red tape, she said, that this should remind me. Um, and um, I think that's the challenge, really. We have to recover the sense of purpose around regulation, why are we doing it? Because only if we have the sense of purpose, regulation, can we work out what's proportionate, proportionate and what we should be trying to do. So I guess I see this as a chance to keep an eye on the purpose um, for which we're doing it, which sort of tracks back to the desire to do the right thing, which was behind my original thoughts of vocation. So that's me, Trish. Um, tell us a bit about you. I went to um, one of your inaugural lectures, the one at Queen Mary, and I was chatting to someone who knew as a medical student who told me you'd been in a punk band. So uh, <laughs> what the transition was from rebel to Oxford professor via the palace for an OBE. So tell us how you're going to be here. The, the, the punk rock band uh, really didn't last very long. I mean, music is not one of my strong points. Um, I studied um, medicine. I've always wanted to, to study medicine. But while I was at Cambridge, I had this fantastic opportunity to also take an intercalated year and, and study social and political sciences. So the, the short answer is um, I've combined a career in medicine with uh, research. And I'm particularly interested at the interface between the social sciences and healthcare. Um, yeah, I had a meandering journey too, Jonathan. I, I actually spent a year doing brain surgery because I, I, I think I was trying to prove a point for feminism or something. I was an absolutely lousy brain surgeon. Um, I ended up doing a doctorate in laboratory science, actually. It was one of those, um, one of those almost a feed and bleed study where you, you have... Um, People with type 1 diabetes were, were coming in, and uh, the idea was to see what happened to their insulin levels and their blood glucose levels after, um, after a meal, but also on days where we were stressing them by giving them one of these psychometric tests that's terribly stressful to do, and, and on control days. And um, it was very interesting, and I learned a lot about laboratory science, but the most interesting thing that happened was on the control days where people weren't doing any stressful activities, I had this extraordinary opportunity to listen to people with type 1 diabetes just chatting for about five hours while, while I was sort of taking the blood and, and um, you know, doing my research. And of, and of course, Within the six months, I'd rather changed my framing. And I remember my supervisor saying to me, well, have you come up with a hypothesis yet? And I said, yes, I have. And I, I said, the, 
the, the key difference between people who are very stable in their diabetes and people who are, who are much more labile seems to be the narrative that happens at or around diagnosis. And my supervisor said, well, you're going to try and study narratives as, as, a, as a research um, uh, question. And I said, yes. And he looked at me kind of as if I was slightly <laughs> nuts and said, have you ever thought of becoming a GP? Um, which for him, was uh, that was the end. In fact, we're good friends again now. But uh, I did become a GP academic. I have been studying um, illness narratives now for about 20 years. It's, it's 30 years since we had that conversation. Um, but I also am very interested and in, increasingly interested in the really macro questions about large-scale organizational change, the uh, interaction between different sectors, so the higher education sector, the uh, health and social care sector, the third sector, um, industry, etc. And I'm starting to do some work looking at large-scale partnerships, research partnerships, and how um, a new research agenda might unfold. Uh, but looking like you, Jonathan, at the, at the sort of regulatory aspects, the governance aspects, as well as at uh, the, the patient voice and how we can bring that in. I have a question about that in a moment, Trish, but that narrative issue seems to be absolutely key for my public service experience. I mean, one of the trickiest things that I had to deal with when I was in the NHS was recovering from financial deficit. <laughs> um, and it turned out that the very people who'd been struggling with it, who couldn't see a way out, could actually work their way out of the hole, whether it's digging or not, I'm not quite sure. But the absolutely crucial thing was restoring hope by making people believe that there was a story that could get to where we wanted to go, um, which was manageable. So it was about breaking down the us and them, and that included us and them with the local community, it included working with um, not new groups for public and patient involvement, but actually with the networks that were already effective. It was the locality networks that the local government had created, uh, it was the people in the hospitals you know, who knew what they wanted and bringing that together to a common story so people could see actually we could have <coughs> a great NHS in the uh, area I was in, in Hampshire uh, and if we worked together and had a shared sense of optimism and hope and direction, the same people who struggled, who had their heads down, got their heads up you know, and they, they got it, well I wouldn't say entirely sorted but pretty much sorted. So um, I wanted to ask you about something you tweeted mm -hmm. earlier. Um, so one of your tweets, there's a few of your tweets, including a plug for a book, which... Um, oh, I sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but you tweeted that you were worried that this conference might be adopting a view of technology which is somewhat deterministic and that that in itself won't create the partnerships that you were beginning to touch on. So I wonder if you could say a bit more about that. Yes. I mean, I'm, I do a lot of research into technology, but I would say that I'm technology agnostic. In other words, I'm not anti-technology. I'm not one of these people that says, well, well because I'm interested in, in the patient voice and the patient experience, I'm therefore high touch and not high tech. I don't see those as opposed at all. Um, and actually, I, I've got a colleague, a friend in, in, um, at the University of Amsterdam, Jeanette Poles. She's written a beautiful book called care at a distance on the closeness of technology, that technology can actually bring people closer together and, and can enhance nursing care and medical care if we get it right. So I'm not opposed to technology. Um, but what I would say, my research into um, the use of technologies in um, effecting change is that technology never drives change. What drives change is exactly the things you've been talking about, um, Jonathan. Um, and we haven't really conferred very much before we, uh, before we had this, but, but you're, you're talking about something that's very dear to my heart, the idea of um, the co-creation process, the bringing together of people from different backgrounds, people who represent different organizations. And that means they're representing different value systems. They have different priorities. Um, and I'm getting very interested in the concept of engagement platforms. So I was going to ask you, how did you kind of pull the rabbit out of the hat in this example that you, you gave me? But let me just talk you through. Um, the idea that one has to bring 
individuals and also organizations and sectors together. And how does one do that? The, the research literature on that is actually fairly sparse. But the notion of a platform, whether it's a virtual platform, whether it's a physical space, uh, is absolutely key. Um, how do we set up the right governance structures? How do we address those issues of power? We all want there to be democratic relationships, but what does that actually mean? And of course, it partly means, and I know this, this is why I keep bringing Jonathan into my own work, get someone who's a really good chair, who is absolutely committed, has the personal integrity to, to really push that, um, that equality agenda. We need time for relationship building. These things don't happen overnight. And, and I'm very interested that you were saying, uh, when, when you described this challenge that you were faced with, it wasn't a question of setting up new structures. It was a question of working with the groups that already existed, building on perhaps the, the limited levels of trust that there already were, but making sure that there was dialogue to build that trust. Um, collaborative sense-making. We, we retrospectively make sense of all the struggles that we've been through through telling stories. And as these groups come together, we get a shared narrative, perhaps not consensus, but, but a, more an understanding of where the different players are coming from. And finally, addressing the practicalities. I've been very, very touched by something Jane Taylor said earlier on, that it's all very well expecting patients to turn up, but not only do they need their expenses paying, they need them paying up front because they may have cash flow problems. And, and the, the, the practicalities and logistics of getting the right people around the table are extremely important. So all those issues around the co-creation of an agenda, whether it's for research, whether it's for service change. Sorry, that was a, a rather long uh, discussion. That, sure. Because I, I think one of the key things I've learned is about <coughs> where things should happen in the spaces. Mm -hmm. So one of, the, uh, one of the most influential learning experiences I had in my time as a, a local NHS chair, um, and Trish will see where some of this is going because she, she knows my wife who's done work in this area. Absolutely. Um, I was chairing a uh, mental health and learning disabilities trust and we thought we'd set ourselves up to be a learning organisation. We would go round the patch uh, that we were serving and we'd have public meetings meeting people. And there was one group of people who came to every single one of those patch meetings and asked a question about our services for the survivors of childhood sexual abuse. Um, mm -hmm. I thought that's a pretty brave thing to do. Uh, so I went to talk to them and said, can I come and meet you? Uh, and I went out to see them on their territory. Mm -hmm. uh, and I learned a few things from that which I think are really important. <coughs> no. One Tell is, us. when people take the, the effort to talk to you, then you damn well need to talk back. Um, it's not an easy thing to do, uh, and you need to respect that. Uh, the second is it's quite unrealistic to expect people to feel comfortable in your environment. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually one of the things I learned about that was when I went to theirs, it was not very comfortable. You know? And that was really important. I went to their spaces where they were comfortable and just listened to them. And they told me a lot of things about our services that I was not hearing from the, the professional um, networks. Um, so I think we need to think about how we go to patients and how we go to potential research participants and current research participants, mm. not just how we incorporate them into our frameworks, because mm. we're almost certainly going to frame things in terms of what we would expect to happen, yep. uh, and that's going to condition things um, enormously. Um, that meeting, that chance meeting, also taught me how important it was for people in positions that they thought were quite senior to spend their time on this agenda. It never occurred to me that my time was a valuable resource in moving this forward till I went to talk to them and they said, you're the first person that they regard as an authority who'd taken the care to go out and hear what they had to say. So that was a validating, it was pretty challenging to me, but it was a validating experience for them. I'm now a patron of that group. My wife did her doctoral research on that. Um, my wife is now working on all sorts of educational materials in order to get that learning available mm. to professionals to uh, be able to support women who had that experience um, better. So there's something about the space. You know, go to yeah. where they are comfortable, mm -hmm. the networks they are already operating, uh, and see what influence um, they can have when we go to them. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more there. And of course, 
in general, we as researchers, we as clinicians, we as you know, industry, whoever, I'm, I'm using the word we in inverted commas here, um, may well not be aware of those spaces. Um, one of the things that, that um, when I was briefed that I was invited to talk about if I wanted to was my own experience as a patient. Um, if you follow me on Twitter, you'll see there's a link to a lecture that I gave when I came off my bike and broke my neck and, and uh, had an interesting experience as a patient. But, but something I don't tweet about much is my more recent experience of going through breast cancer, chemotherapy, you know, the full Monty, you know, major surgery, all the rest of it. Um, touch wood, I'm now um, doing pretty well. But I remember being a patient um, and still thinking in doctor terms. You know, in the first few days, I was being Mrs. Evidence-Based Medicine and all the rest of it. Um, I was treated by a, a wonderful oncologist. I really, I knew this woman because I'd been referring patients to her for 20 years because I knew she was the best oncologist in North London, that kind of thing. And I remember saying to her the day before I started chemotherapy, would I, would I be able to go home on the tube after, after having this sort of four hours of chemotherapy? Oh, yes, no problem at all. Um, well, having experienced it, I can tell you, no, you can't go home on the tube after you've spent three hours having an infusion of chemotherapy. Now, this person was a brilliant oncologist, absolutely brilliant. How come she didn't know? And the answer is, of course, she'd never had one drop of chemo and all the other drugs infused into her. So I, was, I joined an online forum of other breast cancer patients on, I can't remember what the name of the forum is, but there were about 20 or 30 of us in a group, and we all started chemo the same week, and we're still in touch now, sort of a year and a half later. And I, I floated this to them and said, do you know, my oncologist said that I'd be able to go home on the tube. You know, I could barely make it up the stairs into the taxi. Everybody in, in that forum knew they all sort of, you know, sent little smiley faces if they were laughing. Now, the, the people who were the experts on what it is like to receive chemotherapy are the people who've received chemotherapy. The ones who look at the objective biomarkers will tell me all sorts of things about that. But in terms of what it is like to go through an illness experience, the people who are the experts are one's fellow patients. Anyway... I've been involved with that support group now, and we have, I mean, those of you who, I mean, you're all patients, but those of you who've been through serious illness, major sort of medication-related complications, all that kind of thing, will know what I'm talking about. We, the patient community, know a hell of a lot more than the doctors, the researchers, about what that is, but they, we don't invite them into our forums. Nobody... Um, in my patient group would, would think about inviting a professor of, of oncology to, to join us and learn from us. I wonder why not, because they would learn in the same way that I learned how to deal with severe constipation and goodness knows what else while I was on chemo. And that's not something they'll give you in the books. Um, so I think this business about spaces and who's invited into whose spaces and where are those spaces, it's, a, it's the same kind of um, point I'm making with engagement <coughs> platforms, but I guess it's about how do we bring people together on the level, because until we do, um, a lot of this is going to be, uh, you know, motherhood and apple pie, isn't it? Thanks, Trish. We are pretty much out of time. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, I mean, I think there's a real risk that we do nothing um, mm -hmm. as a result of this. Um, just sitting in the last session, we were hearing, I started sketching out what might patient-centred regulation look like. Mm -hmm. Now, I've got a list of, we need not to stop people having the chance to be involved in research by thinking it's too risky for them or not telling them about it. The system needs to make response, take responsibility for us being able to learn from what patients have to tell us. So how do they contribute their experiences mm -hmm. into that? And that very much relates to what you've just been said. There's something about regulatory light touch where there's general co-production. Um, I wondered, so that's my little list to start thinking about things immediately to take away. I wonder what you would hope people took away from this conference to make this worthwhile and make a difference. Do you know, I think the most important thing about this conference, as I said to you before we came down here, um, is there is an extraordinary opportunity here to network. And I think everybody's come here with a different background, a different personal narrative as to why they wanted to come here. And I'm, I'm really impressed with the way they've set up networking opportunities. And so I would say 
one of the things, um, you know, please, those of you who don't go to conferences very often, just go up to somebody and talk to them and say, let's link up. That's really key. Um, I mean, I personally am looking for a couple of people to sit on a big steering group. Um, so I'm going to be going around and, and fingering one or two of you over lunch. Uh, but we've all got different things that we want to take away. But, you know, hats off to the people who organised this conference, people who paid for it, because I, I think it's, it's, it's phenomenal. Great. Thanks very much, Chris. Nice to talk. Cheers.